All right. It's great to have Michael with us. I'm just going to pray for him, and then he's going to share what he has to share with us. Lord Jesus, we just thank you that we can be here, that Michael can be here with us. And I just want to pray your blessing on what he has to share with us this morning, that he would be able to speak into our hearts from your word, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move this morning and what he has to say. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure and a joy for me to be with you. And I'm praying that as we have these mornings together, the material which is familiar to us may become fresh again. But let me start with a question. Do you really want to hear the word of the Lord? Do you really want to hear it? Now, are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? Because what would happen if the word of the Lord said something you didn't want it to say? Now, this question is one of the questions that Jonah will be wrestling with in this entire book. And this morning, I'm going to try and set a cultural context for the book. And we'll be looking at just a few verses. And in the next few days, we'll go into a much more detail in the actual text. Now, my father is from about as far west in Europe as you can go. And my mother is about as far east in Europe as you can go. And I was raised most of my childhood in Saudi Arabia. So I grew up with a non-Christian family in a Muslim country where I heard nothing about the Christian faith. Now, when I was about 17, my parents moved to a country called Cyprus. And in Cyprus, for the first time, I met Christians. And I can remember at that time thinking it would be a good idea to set up a youth group, a group for older teenagers to come together. And I invited some friends to run this group with me. They were Christians. It became a Christian group by accident. I invited all my friends. My brother invited all my friends to this group. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. After about nine months, I was talking with the organizers, and they were saying how disappointed they were because they were trying to arrange for the group to go away for a weekend, but they couldn't get permission from the government to allow it to happen. I remember saying, I can take care of this. I went home. And I spoke to my mother, who was from Cyprus. I said, Mom, I know we have connections. Can you help me? Because the government are denying permission for a camp. She said, whose permission do you need? I said, do you know the chief of police? She said, of course I know him. <laughs> when I was 15, he invited me to go out with him. <laughs> Your uncle George? came, knocked out his two front teeth, and then said, if you ever speak to my sister again, I'll kill you. I said, can you ring him? So she rang him. He said, I had no idea this was your son who wanted to go. If I knew, I would have given permission immediately. So she hung up the phone. He said, he says yes. Who else do you need? I said, do you know the Minister for Interior? She's like, of course we know the Minister for Interior. We make one phone call, he's on holiday. So the President rings the Minister, cancels his holiday, he gives permission for the camp, and a few weeks later, we all go on the camp together. I went a day early, I set up the camp, I invited the people to the camp, and on the second day of the camp, I became a Christian. So God had me organize and plan my own conversion. <laughs> what this story shows is that God is in charge of all missionary activity. And it's also what we're going to read about in the book of Jonah. But in Jonah, we also see something interesting. You see, just before I became a Christian, I had a crisis. And the crisis was this. On the camp, 
I became convinced that the Christian faith was true and real. And at the same time, I realized I didn't want it to be true and real. I was convinced that if I became a Christian, my life would be worse than as a non-Christian. I was very happy, things were going well, and as far as I was concerned, becoming a Christian would make life worse for me in every way. And I realized I didn't want it to be true. I wanted it to be false. And I remember, just as I became a Christian that night, I went to some friends of mine at this camp, and I gathered them together, and I said, I need to tell you something very important. Tonight, I am going to become a Christian. And from now on, I won't be enjoying myself anymore. I was totally sure that becoming a Christian would make me miserable. And here there is a parallel with Jonah. You see, just before I became a Christian, I was sure now that God existed. I had moved from disbelieving in God to believing in God. So at the point of my conversion, I wasn't doubting God's existence. I was doubting God's goodness. God, can I really trust you? Are you really good? Are you truly fair? And this is what Jonah is also wrestling with. Can God ultimately be trusted? Is God just? Now, when you travel around the world and speak to many non-Christians, you hear people ask questions about science and truth. But most of the questions we ask are actually moral complaints about God's existence. We ask questions like, God, if you are so loving, why is there so much suffering? If you are God so loving, why do you judge? God, if you want us to believe in you, why aren't you more obvious to us? Why don't you speak more directly and more clearly? The biggest struggles we have with God are moral questions about what kind of God he is. And Jonah has a huge moral problem with God. The biggest storm you will read about in the book of Jonah is not the storm of the sea. It is the storm of his life. Because everything is difficult for him. In the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve sinned. And when God's presence came to them, they fled and hid from God because they knew they had done something wrong. But in the book of Jonah, God comes and makes his presence known to Jonah, and Jonah runs and hides because he is sure that God is going to do something wrong. And that is what we see at the beginning of Jonah chapter 1 and the beginning of Jonah chapter 4. In Jonah chapter 1, God says to Jonah, get up, go to this place and say that, and he runs away. And in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah says, we read, but to Jonah this seemed very wrong. And he brings his angry complaint before God. And the question is, what is going on here? And there is a sense that in the book of Jonah, God is speaking with a prophetic voice to us today, perhaps with more power and clarity than we actually realize. So let me just say a couple of words about our current European culture. A couple of years ago, I was reading in a British newspaper about a Scottish student who was a member of the National Union of Students in the United Kingdom. She was in the newspaper because in a debate, in the debating chamber of the National Union of Students, she had raised her hand. The reason she raised her hand was that someone had been making a complaint about her and they had published it in the national newspaper. And she was being criticized in the debating chamber for not responding to this criticism. And she put up her hand to make the point 
that instead of publishing a reply in the newspaper, she had rung the people who had complained about her to try to speak to them privately. So instead of fighting with them publicly, she wanted to do it privately. So she raised her hand to make a point of order, to say, I have been trying to speak to my critics, but I've been trying to do it privately. And because she raised her hand, she was expelled from the debating chamber. Now, why? The reason was that the National Union of Students had passed a motion banning the use of hand gesture that denoted disagreement. So any form of gesture with your hand that signaled you disagreed had been banned. By raising her hand, therefore, she was violating this policy and violating what is known as safe space. Universities across the world are now debating about the fact we need to have safe spaces in which there is no disagreement. Because for everyone to feel accepted, everyone must agree. But if you disagree, then that space becomes unsafe. So in order for safe space to be preserved, she has to be disciplined. Now, just before this happened, there was another thing that happened in England. One of Britain's most well-known feminist speakers and authors, a lady called Jermaine Greer, had made comments about transgender people. What she had said is if you are a man and you have an operation to become a woman, you're still a man. Now, she used very rude words, very short words, and as a Christian, I can't tell them to you, although I could tell them to you because you're Christians, you would have to forgive me. <laughs> but she was very offensive in how she said it. So for making these comments, the National Union of Students banned her from speaking at universities. They passed what's called a no-platform policy. They would not give her a platform to speak at university because of what she was saying. At this point, a man called Peter Tatchell, who is one of uh, Britain's leading gay rights activists, who has been campaigning for gay marriage in the United Kingdom for decades, he stood up in front of the nas on national TV and said, not allowing Professor Greer to speak is wrong. You should allow her to speak, you should go and listen to her, and then you should disagree with her and you should ask difficult questions. For saying this, the National Union of Students banned him from speaking at universities. <laughs> the reason they gave was that he was being homophobic against gay people and transphobic against transgender people. At this point, another English academic by the name of Professor Richard Dawkins, one of Britain's most well-known scientists and atheists, came on national television and let it be known what he thought about students who could ban Peter Tatchell for being anti-gay, using very similar short words that Jermaine Greer used. So then the National Union of Students had a debate to ban Richard Dawkins from speaking at universities. Now, this is crazy. What is going on? What is happening? So let us take a step back to look at big picture. In the past, when we analyzed cultures, we would normally talk about honor cultures, and dignity cultures. In an honor culture, the most important thing is we act with honor. What we esteem, what we value, especially in leaders, is that they act honorably, they speak honorably, and they will defend their honor. And so if attacked, they will stand up and they will reply and defend the honor of their name or of their country or of their people. And this is what we look for in leadership. You earn respect by the way you act. Now, in dignity cultures, it's very different. In a dignity culture, you don't have to earn respect. 
you already have it. In a dignity culture, you say, people should respect me because I am a human being. I don't need to do anything to earn it. I don't need to do anything to deserve it. You should treat me properly because I am human. And so in a dignity-based culture, you may be attacked and decide not to defend your honor. You may decide the most dignified thing would be not to say anything publicly, but rather to take the people you disagree with into a small, quiet room, sit with them, talk to them, listen to them, and resolve the problem quietly. And if you did that, that would be seen as a dignified response. And we esteem that value in dignity cultures. We value it. We look for it in our leadership. And traditionally, Europe has been seen as being somewhere halfway between an honor culture and a dignity culture. Now, one thing both of these cultures have in common is, number one, you sort out your own problems. Every time there is a problem, you don't go running to daddy and ask daddy to fix it for you. That is not honorable, and that is not dignified. If you are even a small child and you go to your parents with a problem, they will teach you how you should respond. How do you speak to that person? What do you say? How do you deal with it? So in honor and dignity cultures, you deal with your issue. Secondly, in honor and dignity cultures, you do not go around boasting about the amount of pain or hurt or difficulty you have had. That is not honorable. That's not dignified. You tend to keep it quiet. But increasingly, we are living in what sociologists call a victim culture. In a victim culture, we define ourselves, we get status in society by being victims. Whether it's something that's happening to us right now, something which has happened in the past, or something which has happened in ancient history. We define ourselves by the wrong things which have happened to us. And the more pain we have suffered, the more wrong we have experienced, the greater our victimhood, the greater our status. And so we boast about our pain and our victimhood all the time. We believe it gives us a special status that the rules which apply to everyone else shouldn't apply to us. And the bigger the grievance you have, the more standing you have, the more followers you will have. Which is why in victim cultures, the tendency to exaggerate about pain and suffering, or even invent it or lie about it, is very high. In a victim culture, the narrative becomes this. Everything I do as a victim is explainable only through love. But everything you do, if you disagree with me, is only explainable through hate. If you love me, you will agree with me. But if you disagree with me, you hate me. Which is why we have now all of these phobias. If you want to disagree with anyone or any group, you must hate them. You must be against them. It is impossible to love and to disagree. As soon as you disagree, it proves that you hate. So all of society is divided into one of two groups. One, either one, you are being oppressed. Or two, you are the oppressor. You're the one doing the oppression. Which one are you? And if you speak in disagreement of anything you see in society, you automatically become an oppressor. Which is why so many Christian voices have gone silent around the world. For fear of being interpreted as being oppressive. Being filled with hate. Now if we buy into this and continue to, it is the end of academia. It is the end of the university. The university is born out of the idea that we can disagree, and we need to learn how to disagree. So our world is busily organizing itself into victim groups. I don't have statistics for all of Europe, but in the United Kingdom, right now, 
72% of the population fall into a legally defined victim group. 72% of the population can claim victim status in law. So here's the problem. As every society has its all of its own little victim groups. Does that make sense? Hey, I was raised in the Middle East. You can't speak about my problems unless you have my background. You're not allowed to. Or maybe it's because of my sexual identity. Or maybe it's because of my race. Or maybe it's because of my language. Or maybe it's because of my history. Or maybe it's because of my people. Whatever it is, I have a story to define why I am a victim. And you have all of these little groups in society. And no one is allowed to say anything about the group apart from the people in the group. If you are part of that group, you can speak about the issue. If you are not part of the group, you cannot speak about the issue. You can't even think about it, because you don't understand. If you want to join a victim group, what you have to do is you have to advocate their complaint more vociferously and more militantly than they do. If you without any qualification, advocate their grievance, their complaint, loudly and militantly, they will allow you to join the group. You can be co-opted in. But once you're inside, you can say nothing of disagreement. Because as soon as you disagree, well, actually, no, 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 now you hate us again. And you get thrown out of the group. Think about the political situation of your country. In the past, political leaders could look at society and say, what happened to you was wrong. And that was wrong. And that was terrible. And we should fix it. But what you're now doing is also wrong. And great political leaders, statesmen, states, stateswomen, are bigger than the politics of their time. But where are the statesmen and the stateswomen in Europe today? Where are those voices in the world? Two generations ago, if I asked this question to an audience of this size, many names would be shouted out. But what names would we identify today? People who are bigger than the issue. It's very hard. So the politicians, they do the maths. How many victim groups are there? How many votes in each group? I will advocate their complaint more loudly and more militantly than them, and they will vote for me which means all our politics does is take tense situations and make them worse. We are spiraling up the anger, the hatred, and the division. It is how we motivate people to vote for us. And we have lost leadership. You cannot disagree without saying you're wrong. Is it possible to love someone and say they are wrong? Is that possible? Is it possible that someone may love us so much they would speak a word of correction, a word of rebuke, and warn us about something? Not because they hate us, but because they love us. But we're just simply inflaming our history. So if you're part of a victim group and your university doesn't support and advocate your grievance or your government, or your employer, or your society, the only explanation according to this is they hate you. And so, victim culture is driven by injustice, a huge sense of injustice. In victim culture, I think like this. Look at the pain I have suffered. Look at the misery I have suffered. Look at the hardship I have suffered. Look at the oppression I have suffered. You must agree with everything I am saying. If you don't, you are one of them. And this is why Jonah is so angry. This is the story of Jonah. Jonah is living at a time of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was one of the most powerful empires that ever existed in biblical times. It was also one of the most vicious empires. Imagine if ISIS or Daesh had the military power and capability of America. 
So imagine you took all of the American armed forces, all of the satellites, all of the missiles, aircraft carriers, submarines, all of it, and put it in control of ISIS. What would the world look like right now? Jonah is living at a time where there is this brutal, oppressive, violent empire, and Nineveh is one of the greatest cities in one of the greatest empires that is doing the greatest amount of evil. And he is told to go and preach to it. But Jonah doesn't want them to, for, to repent and be forgiven. Jonah wants them destroyed. He hates them. And so at the end of the book, when God forgives the Assyrians to Jonah, this seems very wrong. And he becomes angry. That word anger in the Hebrew is hard to translate. It means to be so angry you can be physically sick. Have you ever known that kind of anger? He is so angry with God. He is not doubting God's existence. He is doubting God's goodness. God seems to have done something wrong. And Jonah is upset. Now we will speak about this at length on the last day of the conference. But let's just say a few things here to pull this together. I want to make a few points just out of this, this text. I wish I could give you the seven reasons why we ended up in this mess, but there will never be time for that. Unless you want me to speak until tonight. Hosea, Amos, Isaiah, and Jonah, we believe, existed all at the same time. That's an incredible prophetic combination. Imagine if you could come to this conference and the speakers were Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Jonah. Wouldn't you like to hear Jonah's story from his lips? It's a pretty in interesting testimony. But none of us would feel comfortable with what they had to say. In the last chapter of Amos, Amos says to Israel, if you repent, you can be restored. If you do not repent, you will be destroyed. In the last two chapters of Hosea, Hosea says to Israel, if you repent, you will know blessing. But if you do not repent, you will see destruction. In the last chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah lists all the blessings that come to all people who repent and how judgment is reserved for the unrepentant. They are all the same. And here is something even more, well, possibly more interesting. Hosea and Amos prophetically seem to be saying that God will use the Assyrian Empire to punish Israel for their sin. Which means, if Jonah goes to the Assyrians and tells them to repent, and they repent and find favor with God, and they are not destroyed, they will have the military might to attack Israel, his own country. However, if the Assyrians do not repent and God destroys them, they won't have the military might anymore, and Israel will be safe. So Jonah also knows if he goes to preach repentance to Nineveh and they turn to the Lord and Israel refuses to repent, he may be sealing his own nation's destruction. Now just think about that for a minute. Because this is huge. Can you understand why Jonah feels so angry and why he is so uncertain? There is so much at stake here. But the message he is told to preach and the message that Jesus Christ gave us is very different to what Jonah wants at this point. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus tells us, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. These are powerful words. The question in the book of Jonah is not, will God be forgiving? The question in the book of Jonah is, will Jonah be able to forgive himself? And that is the story we will hear about in this book. 
But just think about what country you are from. Think about the political challenges you face right now. Think about the social challenges, the economic challenges, the debates we have at university. This is where we are as a continent. And this is why this book will speak, has such powerful things to say. But I can't just end on this note because I'm an evangelist, which means every morning as I preach, you will feel I am trying to convert you. And you will be correct in that assumption. Because this is also a book about one of the greatest revivals the world has ever seen. It's incredible. About 600,000, 700,000 people lived in Nineveh. That is huge. In some countries represented here, 700,000 people is 25% of the population. Imagine you went to one city, you preached one message, two lines long, and everybody repented, every man, every woman, every child. How would you feel? Would you not feel excited? But do you sense Jonah's anger? You see, all of us, when it comes to preaching the gospel, at times will have to face difficult things. Do you want your enemies to find God's forgiveness? Several years ago, I was speaking at a university. It was quite a large crowd, and every night, the auditorium was full. And every night, as I was preaching, I asked people to stand if they were willing to repent and give their life to Christ. And every night, there was one woman I noticed, and it looked like she was about to stand up, and then she would sit down every night. And every night, I would spend all my time praying and talking to all those who had stood and become Christians. But on the last night, as I was praying, I remember saying to God, if she comes back, help me recognize her. I'll talk to her tonight. And on the last night, she came back. She sat in the same seat. The offer was made. Do you want to receive God's forgiveness? Are you willing to repent for what you have done wrong and to receive God's forgiveness? And she didn't move. So I went to her. I sat down in the empty seat next to her. I said, I've noticed you here every evening. I said, please forgive me if I'm being rude. It looks to me like every evening You've almost stood up, only to sit down. And she said, that's correct. She said, I've been trying to stand up on the inside. I said, why is that? And she said, well, she said, my grandfather was sexually abusing me from the age of four. And if I become a Christian, I am worried I will have to forgive him. So I said to her, What is your counselor telling you? What is your psychologist telling you? She said, he is telling me I must hold on to my anger. So I said, is that working for you? And tears started to come down her cheeks, and she said, no. It's not. She said, I feel like I'm being eaten up on the inside. So I said, look, when you hang on to your anger, Bitterness, a root of bitterness is growing inside of you. And you are now paying twice for the wrong that was done to you. You paid when it was done all that time ago, and you're still paying today. And she said, that's what it feels like. I said, when you receive forgiveness from Christ, you will be able to let go internally. And it will benefit, it's not for the benefit of your grandfather, it's for the benefit of you. And through floods of tears, she gave her life to Christ. And then that next morning said, this is the first time I feel I've been set free. The power of forgiveness can change any society. This is what it means to become a Christian. It is not to simply think something, feel something, do something. It is to receive 
the forgiveness from God. The only way you can receive forgiveness is when you yourself say, I am wrong. That's the only way it works. The only way you can forgive and receive forgiveness is when you admit that you are wrong. You have done something wrong. So even if you offer forgiveness, it can't be received unless there is repentance at the other end. Repentance is how you receive forgiveness. My uh, wife is here. And I remember when I first got married, my father-in-law telling me the hardest thing for the first 10 years of his marriage was saying, I'm sorry. He was correct. You see, the way people apologize, especially husbands to wives, is they say, I'm sorry if I hurt you. I'm sorry if I hurt you. That is not an apology. That is a statement of regret. It means, uh-oh, I can now see you're mad with me. My life just got more complicated. I really wish you weren't mad, and I'm feeling sorry about it. That is not an apology. That is just simply a statement of regret. I'm in trouble. An apology goes like this. I'm sorry. I was wrong. No explanation, no qualification, I was wrong. And when you say those words, you receive the forgiveness that has been offered to you. This is how it works in the Christian faith. When you realize you are wrong, then you receive forgiveness. This is why Jonah hated his message. In Jonah chapter 1, Jonah is told in verse 2, go to the city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So you would think, Jonah would think, great, I hate these people. God hates these people. He says that their wickedness, their wickedness is so big, it's risen to heaven and now God will come and judge them. You think Jonah would be excited. But Jonah knows something. He knows that it is God's plan to be merciful and compassionate. God wants to forgive. And Jonah knows if they are convicted of their sin, then they will say sorry, and then they can receive forgiveness from God. He doesn't want them forgiven. He wants them destroyed. Have you received God's forgiveness? You will know if you have, because two things will have happened. One, you'll be aware of all the terrible things you have done. And at the same time, this incredible love of God, who is doing everything he can to rescue you, to save you, to pay the price that you may be forgiven. That is why it is good news, and it changes lives. Do you know God's forgiveness in your life? I'm going to pray in a minute. And if you don't or you're not sure, make sure of it today. And talk to someone in your response group or one of the prayer counselors tonight wearing the purple badges. Or even in the break, just grab someone who you know knows Jesus and ask them to pray with you. But secondly, and just as importantly, are there people you need to forgive? Forgiveness is easy in the abstract. It is very difficult in the concrete. Who are the people you would find hardest to forgive? Do you have a heart for them to come to know the Lord? Are there people you need to forgive? Are there people in the church you need to forgive? God's call came to Jonah. He told him, gave him a wonderful message, and said, go preach it. But instead of going this way to Nineveh, he went the opposite way to Tarshish. Instead of going uphill, he actually went downhill. He went down, down, down. He got to a port. There was a boat waiting, which simply proves if you want to run away from God, the devil will always provide transportation. 
And then he goes down into the bottom of the boat. And as we will read tomorrow, he eventually goes down to the bottom of the sea. He goes as far as he can. And yet God will still ultimately save him, which is incredible. Do you know that salvation? One last question. Some of you may be thinking about the call on your own life as you're here. You're thinking, this is amazing. Jonah heard this voice. He was given a call. He was told what to do. I need a call. I remember wrestling with this in my own life when I was about your age. During that time, I met an evangelist. He was telling me how his mother, who was a strong Christian, was always telling him, tell people about Jesus. You should be an evangelist. Tell people about Jesus. And every time she spoke to him, he came up with excuses. He was working in a bank. He was very busy. Other people could do it better than him. But his mother wouldn't give up. So he was asking God to help him make his mother quiet. And eventually he thought he got the question that would make his mother be quiet. The next time she said to him, Lewis, you should give up your job and be an evangelist. He looked at her and said, Mother, I haven't received the call. I haven't heard the call from God. How could this be disputed? His mother looked at him and said, the call, the call, the call went out 2,000 years ago. God is waiting for a reply. A job is something you choose. A calling is something that chooses you. God has chosen every one of you to be his witnesses. Where you live, in your Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to your enemies, and to the ends of the world. The question we all face is, are we running to God or away from Him? Some of you this morning need to pray, because God has a call on your life to be His witness, but you feel like you're running away from it. You can make a difference, even in a victim culture. It starts one person, one at a time, forgiving other people and preaching forgiveness. And if you think you're too small to make a difference, you should try sleeping in a bedroom with a mosquito. <laughs> Let us pray. Father God, we want to thank you for your word to us. Lord, I'm very aware that as we are here, there are some who are broken. Lord, you know the pain we have seen. Lord, you have seen the injustice in our life, in our family, in our countries and nations. Lord, you know our histories. Lord, you know the things which divide us and which upset us. But we also know that you are a God who delights in mercy and longs for forgiveness. And so, Lord, we cry out to you today, forgive us. Lord, where we have become victims, help us understand the victory we have in you. Lord, may this narrative not control our life. May you control our life. Father, may we let go of the anger and the disappointment and teach us to forgive as you have forgiven us. And we pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen. You're going to have, I think, some time in discussion groups. And there are some questions which will come up on the screen. They may have been there already. And so take a note of these questions. They may help you in your response time. Are you running from God or to God? Which direction are you heading in right now? Be honest. Who do you find hardest to love? Which means even if you didn't enjoy this morning, you have to come back tomorrow. Is God calling you to a place you would find hard to go? Do you trust God to do what is right, whatever the cost, even if you think it may be wrong? Do you trust him?
And then the question we started with, do you really want to hear his voice? I pray that you do. May God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the day. It will be better than the morning. May God uh, continue to speak to you as you meet with him.